subject, the meek should inherit the earth. I hope that our little study this evening will be a source of encouragement and give us confidence in the promises of God. And what we're going to do is a, a study of Psalm 37. We're just going to look through it and look at the, same, the main teachings of this wonderful psalm. And um, it's interesting how it's put together. I'm not going to go into all the technicalities of it, which is quite complex actually, but it's called uh, an acrostic psalm. There's a number of these in our collection of psalms that we've got. There's a good few of them. This is one of them. Uh, an alphabetic, alphabetical psalm. And what that means is that the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet are used in turn all the way through from beginning to end. And the, the psalm is structured around those. So every two verses or so in this psalm, we have the next letter in the alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet. And so... Um, that in itself is uh, a wonder, a marvellous thing, a wonderful thing, how that could be written in such a way. And I'll say we could talk about that quite a bit. I'm just going to make one little other comment and then we'll, uh, we'll move on from that idea. I think the reason why we've got it written in this form is because the Word of God, which makes up of those 22 letters of the alphabet, the Word of God is so vital in distinguishing the godly from the ungodly. Those who take God seriously will love the word of God. Those who don't will despise it. Just want to make this further little point. The sequence is broken at verse 29, which causes all sorts of Bible students um, issues, including myself. I'm not too sure quite why that is, but the next verse, or the next words they associated with verse 29, where we'd expect the Hebrew would aim, uh, that's missing. But what we do get... The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. And if there's a main message coming out of the whole psalm, it's that. So maybe what that letter's uh, taken out, so it's highlighted. It makes us think about that part of the, the structure and concentrate on those vital words. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. So... Let's have a look at the opening words. We can't go through verse by verse, but we're going to look at the opening words. They're so important. It's a psalm of David, and we know from what he tells us later on in the psalm, he's writing this at the end of his life, and uh, he's reviewing what's happened and what will happen in prospect. So he's, he's looking at things and, and viewing the world, and he realises that men and women fall into these two camps, those that love God and those that don't. And he's writing that we may be those that love the God, the Lord God and be right with him. He's trying to encourage the faithful. Hopefully he's trying to encourage you and I this evening as he writes by the Spirit of God. They're not altogether his words. They're the words of the Almighty working through him. And he opens up by saying this. Fret not thyself because of evildoers. Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. And we get this funny word, fret. Um, don't use that very often, I think, in everyday English, but here it is. It's the word fret. And it's worth just looking at that a bit more closely. Um, we're not going to go through a lot of Hebrew tonight, but there you are. There it is in Hebrew. And in the authorised version of the Bible that we've got, you can see my list there, it's actually... Um, occurs 90 times and it's translated in various ways kindled, wrath, hot, angry, displeased there's our fret there, one of four and so on and so uh, the idea behind this if you can see it already is somebody be, might be angry or getting hot under the collar we might say um, almost like they're going to be self-combust you know the kindle, the idea of kindling is to, to get a fire on the go uh, hence my cartoon picture there. Because if you are looking for righteousness in the earth, if you're looking for justice, if you're looking for things being fair and equal, honest and true, you're going to be disappointed. And David knows that because he's suffered that disappointment. But that disappointment 
to the godly man and woman can actually lead to anger if we're not careful. We can get so frustrated and anger about it. You know, we can bounce on the spot and we can be really, really uptight. And David says, no. <coughs> Calm down. No need to fret. No need to worry. Bad as it might appear to be, bad as it is, bad that, though it may come, God has everything in control. And the judge of all humanity is beholding all things and God will intervene and put things right in due course. Keep faith with God. All these things are implied when he says, fret not because of evildoers. Certainly don't be envious of them. You know, we have plenty of people who work contrary to the ways of God and they get on well, don't they? Despite being um, liars, I'll start thinking of politicians, perhaps they ought not. It's not you know, despite being arrogant, people full of themselves, they get on quite often, they get on. They're very wealthy, they have comfortable lives. Everything seems to go really smooth for them. Quite often it's those who are trying to walk in the right way who seem to have a hard time. David understands that. He's talking about their hair. He says, whatever, whatever you feel, don't get angry about what's going on. Don't get it out of perspective. And certainly don't be envious of workers of iniquity. In other words, don't look at them and want to be like them. That's the last thing you want to do. Verse 7, he'll say, rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. And then he'll use that word fret a third time in verse 8. Cease from anger, forsake wrath, fret not thyself any wise to do evil. So don't get angry. Anger generally is not a good thing. Rest in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. And we're coming to verse, um, the end of that verse 1. And that phrase, workers of iniquity. Just want to pause a little bit of time on that. Because we'll read of it again in Psalm 92. A British man knoweth not, neither doth the fool understand this. When the wicked spring as the grass, when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. But thou, Lord, are most high forevermore. For lo, thine enemies, O Lord, for lo, thine enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. So he says, even when the wicked are doing well and they're flourishing, it is only but like the grass. And we'll come across that idea of the grass again um, very shortly in Psalm 37. But there it is in Psalm 92 when we're looking at this phrase, workers of iniquity. Workers of iniquity... There might be plenty of them now, but they're all going to go. They're all going to be swept away. And the Lord Jesus talks about the workers of iniquity. Keep a marker there in Psalm 37. And come with me to Luke 13. We won't spend too, too long in here. I'm just going to give you these verses here. And you'll get the, the idea, you'll get the flavour of it. And then we'll get back to our psalm. We're not going to move outside of the psalm too much, but I thought this one was worth pursuing. Um, the Lord Jesus is asked a question in verse 23. Lord, are there few that be saved? It's a good question. Are there few that be saved? And this is the Lord Jesus' reply. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up and hath shut to the door, and you begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence ye are. Then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There's our little phrase. There should be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
when you shall see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. And they shall come from the east, and from the west, and from the north, and from the south, and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. So the Lord Jesus talks of two groups of people, the workers of iniquity and those that are alongside the faith of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. From all over the globe it would seem in verse 28, they, they shall come and they'll inherit the earth uh, as we read there in verse 29. They've come from all, all points of the compass. There, are, there will be those of faith. But for those who are not right with God, particularly those that are hypocritical, and then perhaps there's a word in here for all of us, myself included, those who take on the name of Christ or claim to be followers of the Lord Jesus, but in truth, they're not sincere, then there's going to be gnashing of teeth at the day of judgment. So that phrase, workers of iniquity, the Lord Jesus is bringing that to the fore from Psalm 37. And I hope you can see why. It's about being counted amongst those who are going to be cut off and cast away, or those who will inherit the earth. And so we're going to verse 2 of Psalm 32. And I hope you remember that idea of the grass that we had in the other psalm, because here it is now. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. So, the wicked men and women of the earth who seem to be doing really, really well and are very prosperous, well, judgment will come up before them and they'll be cut down like the grass. Uh, they'll have their life, their normal lifespan. It may be a long life. May, they may live to a hundred but one thing's absolutely guaranteed, they will be cut down and they'll go. And it doesn't matter how much they've got in stocks and shares, it doesn't matter how many properties they have in this country, that country and everywhere, irrelevant. They might prolong their life a little bit longer than another because they can have better medical people working for them. But when the Lord takes the spirit of life, the breath of life away from them, they will go. And they do. Very often, those that are wicked, those that are, are not right with God, perish quite early in life. Sometimes very surprising early in life. Such as their cares for looking after what they've got now and the pressures and the stresses of it. And then we get people like, you know, real brutish men and women. Let's face it, we get brutish people like Saddam Hussein. And God sees them judged in another way. And so for all his finery and wonderful palaces, you remember gold taps and all that, solid got Gone. For they soon shall be cut down like the grass and wither as the, the green herb. And the prophet Isaiah takes up that theme. And as he gives his prophecy in Isaiah 40, he actually gives a prophecy of John the Baptist. You remember John the Baptist who heralds the Lord Jesus? who speaks of the Lord Jesus soon coming before the nation of Israel and he's preparing the people. He's looking for repentant hearts. He's looking for willing hearts to accept their Messiah. And he's known as the voice, isn't he? The voice of one who cried in the wilderness. He says of himself. And we're told here, the voice said, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? And this is the message. All flesh is grass and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth. But the word of our God shall stand forever. And therein is our hope. Left to ourselves, all of us, we're mortal, dying creatures, and we're going to be cut down and be no more just as the grass is here today and it's gone in a few days time that's how it is that's what it says here that's the message but so many men and women particularly those who have no faith they live as if they're going to live forever and a day 
They never seem to think about the prospect of long-term illness or sudden death. It never seems to occur to them. Such is their arrogance. Such is their stupidity. But the word of the Lord is what gives us hope that even though these words would be true for us, even for the godly, nevertheless, by the word of God, there is hope beyond the grave. And uh, these words are picked up wonderfully by the Apostle Peter when he talks to those who have been baptised into Christ Jesus. He talks of their new birth, not now so, so much associated with Adam and the certainty of death, even perpetual death. Those who have been born again, now sons and daughters of God. He talks to them, hopefully he's talked to a good many of us here, and those who haven't been baptised, soon to be you. You know, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And then he tells us this little bit that we don't get there in Isaiah. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. The good news. And so we have the good news that we can be given immortality. That even we, if we should go to the dust of the earth, we can be raised from the dead and given life. And inherit the earth. Right, now in the next few words that we've got in, uh, in this psalm. I'm, I've taken a passage here, verses 3 to 8. We have a, a lovely rallying cry. It says, trust in the Lord, do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land. Verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because the man which bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger, forsake wrath, Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Ten things he tells us to do. Trust. Do good. Delight. Commit. Trust. Rest. Wait patiently. Fret not. Cease from anger. Forsake wrath. So if we want to be Godly men and women, if we want to be men and women that the Lord is pleased to save, then we must have this trust. We must delight in his word and in his purpose. We must rest in him, have faith in him, confidence in him. Mm. We're certainly not going to be men and women of anger and of wrath, but we're going to be patient, men and women. In common parlance, we're going to tough it out. We're going to tough it out. So yeah, those around us might do much better than us and this and that. Bigger cars, bigger houses, bigger whatever. So, first priority is committing ourselves unto the Lord and trusting in Him and seeking to be like Him. So then we read in verse 9, the very beginning of verse 9, it says... For evil doers shall be cut off. I think that's been clear from what I've said already, but I'm going to run through now what, what we get through the psalm. Punctuating the psalm. Bang, 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 all the way through. Because it's there in verse 9. We get it again in verse 22. We get it again in verse 28. 34. 38. Whoa, we'll, we'll stop there. So we've got it five times. David is getting the message over five times. They're going to go. They're not going to live forever. It doesn't matter what their ambitions are and how much estate they've got now 
how much glory and status they have in this world, if they're not humble before the true and living God, they'll go. They'll go. Taking the last one, verse 38. The transgressors shall be destroyed together. The end of the wicked shall be cut off. It's a hard-hitting message, but it's the truth. Second half of the verse, verse 9. What a contrast. But those who wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. It's about waiting. It's not the here and now. It's about waiting. And we know from other scriptures, it's about waiting for Messiah. It's about waiting for King of Kings to come, establish his reign, his reign of righteousness. It's about waiting for the Lord to, to come again in that power and in that authority to dispense justice and righteousness in the earth then that waiting will be also also worth it for they shall inherit the earth what an inheritance the earth populated no longer with tyrants self-centered men and women so often and the uh, state of great disarmament no we're going to see people of faith pleasing unto God and they will inherit the earth and he'll make mention of it in the next two verses end of verse 11 notice it's there again they shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace now there's no peace now it's not an abundant I mean yesterday I don't know all the circumstances, but I heard on the radio yesterday that a 10-year-old got stabbed in our country. You know, and we're in a relatively peaceful country. Of all the places on the earth, I probably want to be here. Maybe New Zealand would be top of the list, actually, with one or two come a bit higher. But generally, we're in a peaceful country. But a 10-year-old gets stabbed. What's going on? But look at this. The meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. It's not going to be peace in this locality and in this everywhere. Worldwide peace. And then he make mention again of this inheritance in verse 18. The Lord knows the days of the upright. He'll know of us. He won't forget us, even when we're in the dust of the ground, for years. You know, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the Lord Jesus spoke of them. In Luke 13, they've already been dead for thousands of years. But he knew they hadn't been forgotten of God, and they're still not forgotten of God. It matters not. They pleased God in their days, and they're remembered of him, and they'll have their inheritance, along with all the others that come all parts of the globe, as the Lord Jesus said, but they're the ones that have been in the narrow way, The answer to the question, are there few that be saved? Few in each generation, but a multitude overall. And we've got to keep that in view. We may be few now, but in the kingdom, there's a few from every generation, then there's a multitude. And Revelation certainly talks of a, a multitude, well blessed, and singing unto God in thanksgiving. Verse 22, there it is again. Blessed of him shall inherit the earth. And there's one more. So how many times have we got it? One, two, three, four, five. So we've got five cutting offs. And we've got here, by the contrast, the inheritance of the land. They shall inherit the earth. Verse 34. Wait on the Lord. Keep his way. And he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. You know, it's not about going to heaven when we die, is it? It's not a paradise up in the skies. It's about the earth put right, where the meek flourish at long last. The blessing for the faithful is upon the earth, 
a glorified earth. We come down to verse 16, and I think this is a nice little excitation for us, a nice little lesson for us to, to take hold of. Because David says, A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. And it takes, it takes faith to believe that sometimes. You know, the world that we live in, the Western world, the society we live in, we're being encouraged all the time to seek more riches. You do this, you'll get a better wage. You do this, you'll have a better return on your investment. You do this, then you'll be, look, you know, money, 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 riches, you know. A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. You could be in poverty in terms of this life and the things of this life, the wealth that this life can give. But if you are rich in faith toward God and are seen by God as that, then you are exceedingly rich. Perhaps richer than you really know. You have to have faith to believe it. So what of the evildoers? What of the workers of iniquity? Don't be envious of them. Whatever they have, it's of no consequence. Let them have the riches of this world. It's all going to go, just like the graph will go. A little that a righteous man hath is better. Proverbs says, better is a little with righteousness than great revenues without right. Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure with trouble and trouble therewith. I've got another passage there with that in mind, 1 Timothy 6, but we're not going to look at that this evening. I'm going to see how the clock's going. But look at that. And the lessons forcibly brought home by the Apostle Paul. Don't make money a top priority in life. If you become rich in life, that's good. But make sure you're always rich with God. You know, Abraham was rich. There, there are faithful ones in Scripture that are rich. But they didn't hide, hold their riches in great esteem. And by... Um, Often by reputation, they were very generous in their riches and very wise with their riches. But the Lord Jesus says that's very, very difficult to achieve. Hardly ever would a rich man enter into the kingdom of God. The Apostle Paul in that passage talks about the folly of having a love, having a love for riches. Riches themselves not a problem, but it's the love of riches. It can cause all sorts of problems in this life and in terms of the kingdom to come not good so it's a good exhortation that that he gives us a good warning there relevant in this day certainly relevant in our materially which, uh, rich society that we live in a little a righteous man is better than the riches of many wicked they come down to verse 23 of the psalm and he says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighted in his way. So the question is are our steps guided or ordered by the Lord? Psalm 19 how sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And in the same psalm he says, order my steps in thy word. Let not any iniquity of dominion over me. And I've highlighted in red the word ordered there in verse 23 of our psalm, and order there in Psalm 119. It's the same word in the Hebrew. And you can see what the prayer is. David is saying he wants to be instructed in the ways of godliness, and he knows that that is done 
by him reading and thinking and meditating and then applying the word of the Lord. That's why we have graciously been given it, so that we can feed upon it. And then we're enlightened. We're not groping around in the dark. We know how to walk. And we take courage and we do it. And notice in that Psalm 119 how he loves the word. Sweet to my taste. It doesn't necessarily have to be arduous. It's not, it's not um, something where you've got to read because you have to, as if it's some academic exercise. No, you, as you read it, you come to be uplifted by it. You'll be comforted about it. There'll be joy. Joy in the reading of it because you can see that it's true. And God is mindful of the faithful. And the faithful are blessed and will be blessed. You're in company of them. In our psalm tonight, verse 30, 31. The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom, and his tongue talketh of judgment. The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. So that should be our aspiration. That's what we should be about. Having that wisdom which is from above. Talking of the ways of God. And being led by the teaching of the Lord God and the Lord Jesus Christ. But we all make mistakes. Only the Lord Jesus has lived faithfully, totally compliant and to the full regarding the word of the Lord. He was beyond reproach. He did all things well, perfect before his heavenly Father. Everyone else, even the most faithful of others, through the weakness of the flesh, the weakness of the nature that we bear, we, we, we sin and we fall. But he says in this psalm, does David, though, though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. And so we have this relationship with God, even when we let our God down. If we show our remorse at that, if we show that we're saddened that we've done that or we've thought that, and we're longer to be different than the Lord in the figure there takes us by the hand, lifts us up, sets us on our way again. So yeah, we all slip up. It's inevitable. But the Lord upholdeth all that fall and raiseth up all those that be bowed down. <coughs> For a just man falleth seven times and riseth again. But the wicked shall fall into mischief. You know, the wicked fall, they, they fall and they don't necessarily have any desire to, to get up, do they? They're down there, they want to stay down there. But for us who have higher, loftier aspirations, we're appalled at the falling. And we ask for the picking up. And the Lord says, I'll pick you up seven times if need be. Lovely message of hope there in that verse 24 of our psalm. Sadly, if we're trying to live a godly life, we're going to have people looking at us. Maybe uh, the evildoers. But people will be looking at us and watching us to see if we will fall. They may even put stumbling blocks in there so, so what we do fall if we're not careful. So there's people there watching us to bring us down and make, make light of us, to mock us and to mock our God. And as you read through scripture, you see that the faithful sometimes sadly have that reaction from those around them. Those around them try to discourage and make the way difficult. And the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus experienced that. 
in his own life there were men and women trying to catch him in his words and try and trap him and in so doing working a case against him so that he could be taken away to be no more and when he was taken away and crucified all the charges were false but it suited the Gentile powers of the day as well as the Jewish at that time to take he who is the righteous one and put him to the tree. What an indictment on the wickedness of man. Awful. So the Lord experienced that and we may experience it. David knows that. He speaks of it here in this psalm. We, you know, we're trying to live a godly life We'll have others that will try their best to bring us down. But we've got to work, work through it and have faith. Now there's the words from Luke regarding the Lord Jesus. They watched him, sent forth spies. They even feigned themselves to be just men. That they might take hold of his words. But the Lord remained firm. And as we come to the end of this psalm, he says, I've seen the wicked in great power, spreading himself like a green bay tree. Yet he passed away, and lo, he was not. Yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. And David's probably thinking of his own experience, and he's thinking of those wicked men that hounded him and, and gave him a tough time under the command of Saul. And for a while they were very prominent and they were very powerful. But then they were swept away of God like a tree cut down and they couldn't be found. And David says, learn from that. Now that may not be our experience that that person at work or our neighbour, dare I say family member, hope not, but that person that gives us a hard time because we come to the, the Christadelphian Hall here at Rugby or we try on our best to, to walk in the way of the Lord Jesus people who give us our time they may not disappear as David says like that but when Christ comes all the green bay trees will come down all of them his judgments will go forth and they won't be found And then the psalmist goes on and he says, Mark the perfect man and behold the upright. For the end of that man is peace. And there's a contrast here. Can you see that? A beautiful contrast. He says there may be this man in great power who spreads himself out. His influence goes far and wide. Great man of power. But he's a wicked man. He says he'll go... <coughs> But take note of the perfect man, the upright one. The end of him is not a cutting down. The end for him is peace. So who is he talking about? He's talking about the Lord Jesus, isn't he? First and foremost, he's talking about he who was perfect in every respect before the Lord God. In fact, in another psalm, in prophecy, he says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he should be like a tree, planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. This tree stands, and is ever fruitful. Not like the wicked, cut off to be gone. Mark the perfect man. So those men and women amongst us who are godly, who are aspiring to be like the Lord Jesus, who show Christ-like qualities and characteristics, we need to look them out. We need to be with our fellow brethren and sisters here. We need to learn from those that are endeavouring to be like the Lord Jesus. To be with them is to go in the way of peace. 
Mark the perfect man. And so I take you to Matthew 5 as we finish this evening. We mark the perfect man now as we read these words. Wonderful words. What a doctrine. What a way of living that he presents to us. And what a hope of a glorious future he puts before us. And he says there in verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And so the Lord Jesus says there's all these blessings, all these blessings. And so we do well to mark the perfect man. Let us learn of the Lord Jesus. Let's be like him, that we're walking after his footsteps and not in the steps of the wicked. Let us be associated with him. And did you notice in the middle of that teaching of all those blessings, the Lord Jesus makes use of Psalm 37. Blessed are the meek, those which are humble before God, those who are teachable before the Lord, those that are humble even in the face of hostility of men around them blessed are they for they shall inherit the earth and so that's what we long for and we pray for and we long for the grace of God to come soon and I'll leave you with the, the last words of the psalm the salvation of the righteous, of the righteous is of the Lord he is their strength in time of trouble and the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him.